So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Emerge Africa webinar, Design in the Open, with Dr. Jennifer Madrill and Dr. Tonya Doucet. A little bit more about them. Um, they are uh, facilitating an online course called Design in the Open as part of uh, Designers for Learning, and I'm sure they're going to be telling you a little bit more about that. So Dr. Jennifer Madrill is the founder of Designers for Learning, which is a nonprofit in the U.S. that facilitates service learning opportunities to support underserved educational needs. She completed her PhD in Instructional Design and Technology Program at Old Dominion University, where she was awarded a dissertation fellowship to complete her research and served as an adjunct assistant. Uh, Tanya, Dr. Tanya A. Dusset is Assistant Professor in Moscow, Idaho. Um, yes, I recently learned that there's a Moscow in Idaho and not just Russia. Uh, she's a Google, Google Certified Innovator and Google Certified Trainer with more than 15 years of instructional design and e-learning project management experience. She completed her PhD in Learning, Design and Technology at the University of Georgia. And she is an Assistant Professor of Learning Sciences at the University of Idaho. Um, yeah, so I'm going to hand over to Jen. Thank you very much both um, for presenting for us today. Oh, this is a really wonderful opportunity. I, I think I participated about 18 months ago in another webinar with my colleague John Bakke. And um, we are based, as you mentioned, in the United States. I'm physically sitting in Chicago right now, but um, we really appreciate the opportunity to um, connect with others outside of North America. Uh, we had the opportunity last year to connect with um, folks from Emerge Africa at AECT, which is our um, a large international association on, internet, um, on instructional design. And so it gave us the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face where we um, also benefit from these online interactions. It's also a great rare opportunity to meet in, in person. So I really thank you very much for including us. Um, and yeah, I think um, what I'm going to do is just kind of hop in. Tanya and I, um, we worked on a, the course development um, for a cl class called Design in the Open. Um, Tanya, as you mentioned, is a teacher. I work for a nonprofit where we're giving folks experiential learning opportunities to gain instructional design experience. And so I know I receive multiple questions a week, and I'm assuming Tanya does as well, is how do I cultivate my professional presence? It's one thing to take courses that give you the theory and the research and what you're doing, but when you're new to a field and you're trying to make a mark, what are some things that you can do to put yourself out there, um, make it um, available for others to find you, and for, most importantly, an employer to find you, or potentially a collaborator, or some, some person that you're trying to connect with on a project? And so I, if, over the years, try to think of ways to do this because there isn't a, a single answer that you can give somebody. It really is a more of a holistic approach to how you put yourself out in the world. And a couple years ago, I stumbled on a book called Show Your Work. It's by Austin Kleon. It's not an expensive book, so I don't mind promoting it. It's not an instructional design book uh, it, at all. It's, again, more of a way to consider your how you are presenting yourself and your work, and very much with the um, appreciation for how much benefit you derive by showing openly your process, your work product, and what you can gain from that. And so what, what I'd like to do today, um, when Tanya and I were, were working on developing the course that we're offering right now, um, we had the opportunity to conduct um, an, an, inter an interview or a discussion, and we went through their 10 different principles within Show Your Work. And so what I wanted to do today was to go through those separately and give Tanya the opportunity to share some of her thoughts. We really, this is unscripted uh, for the most part between Tanya and I. I think that usually works best to have an open conversation. But we also um, would like to make sure that you have the opportunity to chime in and, um, and give, give your thoughts on the importance of openness in your practice and some of the things for, for um for that you're doing in your work and in your um, professional development to design in the open. So what I wanted to do first, we very much encourage the use of the text chat. So within our course, we have challenges that we ask people to participate in as a means of 
practicing what we're what we're trying the, the theories and the concepts we're trying to teach. So in the text chat, I just put in a kind of our first challenge. And what I like to do when I when people are asking me for their my advice on how they should get themselves out there pro professionally, I I usually ask, well, how, what would someone find out about you if they were to do a vanity search? And a vanity search is simply typing your name in the Google search bar or whatever your um, your search of choice is, and see what comes back because. That's what people are going to do when they meet you for the first time. Or if you're reaching out to a new employer or you're reaching out to a potential collaborator, you can bet it's pretty much 100% likelihood they're going to go to the internet and try to find out something about you. So that's, that's the way we start our course is um, asking folks through a challenge is to go out and find what you find out about yourself. I happen to have a fairly uncommon name especially within the instructional design field. So if you type Jennifer Madrill, you're going to get me pretty much 100% of the time. Now, if you have a more common name, for example, here in North America, Jane Smith would probably, you'd have a pretty small likelihood that that would find you. So then you have to start thinking, if you have a more common name, what are you doing uh, as, you, as you put yourself out there into the world to, um, to get your name out there? So Tanya, I don't know, you want to hop in now and kind of add your two cents on this whole concept of showing your work and openness as kind of a preamble to our, our discussion on the principles? Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. One of the things I like talking about with the vanity search is we have to think about the message that we send. And when I meet somebody at a professional meeting or if I'm just out and about, great example, a uh, in March, actually, I was in Washington, D.C. for a conference, the Society for Information Technology and Teacher Education, and I ran into a woman in line at the National Archives. We started chatting. It turns out her granddaughter was looking at schools out west for university. And so in our conversation, I was able to give her my card, and she noticed that my first name was spelled uniquely. And I said, it's okay if you lose my card, if you can just remember my name. I have a very wide digital footprint and that is on purpose because I don't want to miss out on an opportunity to connect with somebody. And having a unique name helps, but I'll also say that I'm not the only Tanya Doucet in the world. That's why I use the Tanya A at times. Uh, there was a woman who married into my family and her name is Tony and her middle name begins with an A and somebody truncated that at some point. So when we talk about your digital footprint, making sure that you're sending the message that you want to send, that people can find you when they go looking for you. Now, you might be saying to yourself, you don't always want to be found, but perhaps that's your personal life and not your professional. But trying to make sure that people can connect you with you is key. And my digital footprint is purposefully cultivated. I've used a website called Brand Yourself. I'm putting it in the text box, .com. I use and I recommend this website to others with a caveat. They will constantly try to sell you a product to help you with your footprint. And you constantly click no, I'm not going to pay for this. But it gives you some interesting tools to let you see what search results come up when your name comes up. You can connect your different social media profiles and take a look at what message you're sending with just that profile. Thanks, Jennifer. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And this really is an interesting conversation. I believe Tanya and I talked about it when we were doing our um, preparation for the cl class I mentioned, is this idea of personal branding and how that relates to your professional presence. And there's kind of two, two ways to look at it. You know, there's, as, as, as Tanya mentioned, um, and, and as I used in my challenge, it's kind of thinking how people perceive you by what they see online. But what, what, what I think we're, hopefully we're going to get through um, within as we're talking is that it's really much more than that. Um, there, it's really a two-way street when you put yourself out there. You're giving to the network as a collective, and in turn, people are then giving back. Once people understand what you are about and what you're interested in, it's amazing then what you end up getting back that you didn't even realize. So it's not just a, a matter of pushing out information about yourself, but it's also then kind of that network currency. And I think that theme is going to come up hopefully through some of our examples and, and some of our stories. Um, so here's a uh, picture of Austin. We're going to be relying on a lot of his concepts. So I want to make sure he gets full credit for <laughs> the things we're talking about today. He 
he did the hard work of um, taking all of these concepts and putting it in, into um, some language that um, is, is accessible for most of us to try to understand these, these fairly vague concepts. So let's just jump right in. One of the first concepts that he talks about in, this, in the book is you don't have to be a genius. And this one really resonates with me, again, with this perspective of trying to help um, emerging scholars, emerging instructional designers as they're thinking about going out into the world. Very often, it's very common human nature that when you're trying something new, you don't want to be the person that puts your, yourself out there to show what you don't know. And he's, through this first chapter of the book, um, giving you permission <laughs> to go out into the world and admit to the world, I don't know 100% about what I'm talking about, that you still have things to offer. And, um, and, and not only that, do you have things to offer, by doing that, you're reaching out most likely to experts who are going to be able to help you. And so by asking the question, um, as you're telling, going out in the world saying, this is, I'm putting my name out in this field as someone who wants to become an expert in this field, but I need help. And if you kind of do approach it with that, with that, um, again, tying back to my comments a moment ago, what comes back at you is, is much more than you would ever expect. And um, so, Tanya, I don't know, again, you work, we've not, as we said, prepared a lot of the back and forth here, but I'm sure you have multiple exam examples given you were an emerging scholar at one point, and now you're working with emerging scholar, scholars. Would you mind talking a little bit about um, that idea of putting yourself out there before, as you're a novice and before you're necessarily considered an expert in the field? Absolutely. This is one of those topics that I love because you can make connection with others. And he'll love it if he watches the recording, but I'm going to talk about Dr. Rob Moore. He's a recent graduate of North Carolina State University, <laughs> finished his PhD and graduated about a week ago, actually. So we're all very proud of Rob. And I think, Jennifer, you're familiar with Rob, aren't you? He's become one of our... Uh, spokespersons for AECT in a lot of environments. Uh, he originally contacted me, goodness, I guess it's been about five years, he was starting his doc program and emailed me and asked if I could give him some advice on a particular paper that he was writing and considering submitting to the Journal of Applied Instructional Design. Uh, Dr. Willie Savigny is on the editorial board for that and I've worked with Willie a few times. So it was as as a scholar in the field, when we get contacted by someone who identifies as a novice, many of us take that as an opportunity to mentor. So I was excited to see that we had this budding scholar who was interested in publishing in applied instructional design, a field that I had worked in for quite a while and had recently completed my own degree in, and now a student was seeking feedback. We set up a video conference meeting. And I went through his paper with him and gave him pointed feedback to help him with getting that published. On the flip side, I think about when I was becoming or assuming this professional personality that I've adopted that is me. And I remember the, the fear of trying to contact someone and saying, hey, could I get your advice on this? Social media brings with it this interesting affinity space where we can feel safe in certain areas. We have a fantastic group for eMERGE Africa where you can connect with one another, you can connect with others in the field, and I love these spaces. AECT has groups for each of its divisions. If you're trying to find information about a particular area, that's where you can go and say, I'm not the expert. I know quite a bit about online instructional design, but I've never worked in a particular context, say, K-12 online education. So I might be able to connect with someone like Michael Barber or Jared Borup. Michael's done quite a bit of research in New Zealand in particular related to online K-12. Jared Borup has done a lot of work in the United States related to online K-12. So maybe I can connect with them in these groups and get some advice. Maybe there's literature they can help me find or there's instruments they can help me find. Similarly, along those lines, we've had a lot of conversations around how do we engage more deeply and how do we measure engagement in online contexts? Well, there is a learner engagement SIG of AECT. There is a LinkedIn group. There is a Facebook group. And we've had a couple of conversations where members have gotten connected. This is where we really draw upon this constructivist future that we've built. You don't have to be the genius but you can connect with the genius to help you be successful in whatever it is you're trying to do. Yay, 
Yay, Alice is here. Time. Yay, hi, Alice. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, we were at AACT last year, and I had the opportunity to meet Alice. If it's the same Alice, I'm assuming it's the same Alice. <laughs> and hello, hello, it is. Um, yeah, and I, I think you brought up a per perfect example of Rob Moore. And for those of you who spend any time on uh, Facebook or social media um, uh, on, on Facebook, I thought he did a great job to the point of what we're talking about today as he was progressing through his dissertation. He was talking about the apprehensions you have when your population you're studying is maybe not responding as quickly as you'd like or you get the data back and you're not exactly sure what to do with it and how to find themes from it. And he was just very open about his process that he went through in the dissertation where it would be really easy for a person um, to have those natural emotions, like I'm not going to tell people right now what I don't know about my dissertation, which is supposed to be the seminal product that I finish as part of my scholarly output when I graduate with my PhD. Um, and he really took the risk. And I, I think um, to, to all the examples you gave, it really he's seen the benefits as, as he's moving forward. Um, so with that, let's move on to the next, um, next comments. We've already touched on this one. So I won't spend a ton of time, but um, I really do think this is one of the most, well, it's hard for me. I almost say every time I get to a principle in Cleon that it's the most important, but I really do think this is a pretty key principle within the book, is to think about process, not product. We often, when we're thinking about branding and putting ourselves out there, we think about creating a lovely portfolio with all of our curated, perfect um, artifacts of things that we've created in our school or, or in our work that we want to put out there is almost like an online resume. And, and that's great. That, ha that serves a purpose as well. But I think the examples we just shared um, with Rob and, and others that Tanya just example, um, the examples that Tanya shared really get to this idea that people are really much more interested in your process. If, if I understand what you went through and what are the, the challenges you faced and the opportunities that you, make, that you are presenting that you make, it think, make me understand and think it's important for me to try to, to replicate what you're doing, that really revolves more around process, not necessarily the outcome and the product. And it may be a failure. It may be something that you've done that has not worked, but me knowing how you did it and the steps you took will help me as I'm going through and hopefully not make those mistakes. Um, so that, again, that's an important concept. And then I think this is um, the concept that, and the principle in the book that I think Tanya really has the most to, um, to offer to our conversation today. The reason I know, I feel that I know, and I, if you could see me, I'm putting in, in air quotes here, that I know Tanya is because of her daily um, effort to put something small out there about herself. I'll use the example of how I really most recently engaged with Tanya is when she switched to a new college, to a new university, a new institution. And she spent um, small portions, small chunks of each day taking us through what it was like for her to be new faculty um, at, this, at this campus. And I got to learn about her university, some of the projects she's working on, some of the collaborators that she was engaging with. And so, Tanya, would, would you mind um, t spending a little time telling us about why you made the decision to share on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook what you were experiencing as you were coming as a new, um, new faculty to your university? Absolutely. I just put in the chat box a link to the last post from this year's effort, day 106. This was something that I started when I first took on my professional role as a tenure track faculty member in the United States. I had graduated from the University of Georgia. I had taken a position at the University of Wyoming. And I never had a single friend or family member who had ever been to the state of Wyoming much less to the University of Wyoming or to Laramie. Uh, I only knew about the town and the state, what I had read in newspapers and online. So I thought, well, how can I share this new journey with my family and my friends? And how can I get to know my new campus? Because this is a new place for me. And I decided that I would do this through a daily photo. This was, uh, gosh, the fall of 2013. So it, it's been five years now. Every day that I was on campus, I forced myself to go to a different building because it's very easy in our professional lives to become chained to our desks, whether that's a home office or a campus office or a corporate office. We don't often get up and walk around our floor, much less our building, much less a campus or a downtown or other industrial park area. 
So I would get out and go to a different building. I would volunteer for meetings, or if I was meeting with someone, I would volunteer to meet them in another building on campus just so that I could get to see the architecture. Because if you look at the world around you, it's funny when I go back now and I look at research about environment and work environment, our architecture of our cities and our buildings tell their own story. And that's what I found that I was doing. I was learning about the history of my campus, of the buildings on it, who built them and why were they built. And I was finding interesting things to connect with, whether it was a mural painted on a wall or in the case of the University of Idaho, I, there's some people on campus who love post-its as much as I do. If you scroll back through my pictures this year, you'll see that I took two photos of our art and architecture building where someone had spelled something out with post-it notes in the windows and you could see them from outside. And it was comical, but I have found a kindred spirit on my campus and I want to meet them. The first time it said something about UG fries. The second time it said got trek. Sorry, I had a bit of an audio background noise there. Uh, when it comes to sharing a little bit every day, I've tried to share this journey of joining a new campus. It both helped me assimilate to my campus, but it also shared out with my friends and family. When I share these pictures, if I share a picture of a building, I would try to look up the history of that building or when it was renovated or why something in particular was posted. One of my recent pictures from Idaho actually, had, it just says engineer like a vandal and it was part of our entrepreneurial day. Now this is where I'll back up real quick and give you a little bit of history about the University of Idaho as a result of having to learn these things. First of all, it, we are located in northern Idaho. I'm only um, a three hour drive from the Canadian border and the land that our university sits on was provided by the Nez Perce tribe. There are five nations that surround our university in terms of owning land and having reservations that are set up here in the US. So that was one thing that I learned by attending these different meetings on campus. So it was very cool for me to go, oh wow, now I know who to be grateful to for the land that we sit on. But then as I began to interact with these buildings, I had to learn more about what was going on. So what is a vandal? We are the Idaho Vandals, which sounds like a very strange mascot to adopt. In the 1940s, I believe, maybe 1930s, our basketball team was apparently very good. And they were described by a sports writer as vandalizing their opponents. At that time, we did not have a mascot, but many other sports writers began to use that same moniker or that same term, we were vandalizing the opponents we played in athletic events. So vandals stuck. Now we are the Idaho Vandals. We use kind of a, a Viking style mascot for the depiction of this vandal, but we use vandal or like a vandal as a phrase lately to help promote what we do on campus. So engineer like a vandal. It was painted on a bay door of our engineering building. And now we're looking at in our college of education, Maybe we could have some other slogans, innovate like a vandal, teach like a vandal, design like a vandal, to bring it back to where we are. Yeah, I think that's a, a, great, um, a great story because I've moved around. I'm sure many people that are, who are joining us today have moved to different areas. And usually the last thing you're thinking about is what is the history of where I'm from. But at the, at the same time, that is the most important way for you to connect with those that you're engaging with. The fact that then it's almost like when you travel to another country where they, they, they don't speak from me, they don't speak English. It's just polite <laughs> to learn something about their history and their culture and their language and to say hello and thank you in their language. Um, and, and I think the same is true for your example when you joined the, the, the university. This was a way for you to connect and to show that you want to be part of their community. Again, small things you did every day, you learned something and then also showed that you were interested in, in being part of, the, um, in being part of that, that culture that you were joining. And what I want to do now, um, as I mentioned, we, we really encourage you to continue using the text chat. I'm loving, I'm following along as best I can here, reading and, and talking at the same time. But I'm just putting in the text chat right now another challenge 
that comes directly from our course, and I think it would be something we could we could try to chew on here as we're talking. We talked a lot about online presence and things that you're doing in, in an online space, but this whole concept of designing in the open and sharing your work definitely extends to our real life, our face-to-face -face life, um, interacting with others. And so what I put in the text chat is a challenge for you to be purposeful in where you're spending your time in a professional capacity. This year, I personally, uh, our, our nonprofit is, um, we just joined an, an organization called the Chicago Literacy Alliance, and it's 130 nonprofits based here in Chicago, all de dedicated to literacy. And it, it was completely overwhelming for me to think about how am I going to meet all, or a large percentage of these 130 nonprofits that could potentially be collaborators for me. And as I was having conversations with new people, I was just flooded with opportunities to attend conferences, to, to join conference calls, to go to meetings, and to meet this new person and that new person. And so it really uh, resonated with me, this idea that we, we, we really need to be purposeful on, is in terms of what organizations are we joining? Is it furthering our professional aims? What is, what, what is it giving us in terms of opportunities to present ourselves, present our process, present our work? And in, in many ways, it was a good problem for me to have in the last year that I've had multiple um, opportunities that I was unable to attend. But it really has uh, resonated with me, this idea of taking stock in where it is you want to spend your time and present. We've already mentioned AECT a couple times already. That's, a, again, our professional organization for instructional designers. But just attending or being a member of an organization like that is not necessarily being purposeful. Yes, you're being purposeful in that you've sought out the organization and you've thought through um, what, what, what organization you want to join. But what are you doing in terms of how you're contributing? Again, this whole idea of sharing your work, sharing your process. And again, this whole idea of thinking through as an emerging scholar or someone new to a field or new to an organization Thinking through as you're planning your next six to nine to almost a year out as conferences, the calls come up, what are things that you could do to present? Could you be an exhibitor? This is something that we've um, taken advantage of here as our new nonprofit trying to get out in the world. We've set up exhibit booths. If you uh, have a conference that you're interested in, very often if you're an emerging entity, maybe a nonprofit or you're a school group or you're... Um, a college student who wants to get your name out there, if you go to the conference organizers and say, we've got a project we're working on and we'd love to have a small table off here to the side where we could present our work, most often I've found in my um, experience doing this, you can get it either for free or for a very limited um, uh, discounted cost. So those are just some of the examples that I'm, I have in my own life outside of online presence where taking this pur purposeful approach to how can I put my presence uh, out there uh, so people are, are better able to understand me and the work I'm doing. Um, and I don't know, Tanya, I'll, I'll pause for a moment. Do you have any, any thoughts on that, kind of thinking outside the box in terms of the online presence, thinking more in terms of some of the things you've done from a face-to-face -face perspective? I actually want to pick up with Nicola's comment about it can be virtual too because I do love the upcoming uh, online festival. But I'm thinking in particular about opportunities that I've had to present abroad when I didn't have the money to go abroad. About, gosh, two or three years ago, I was working with a colleague of mine at Northern Illinois and a joint graduate student. Uh, she is his chairperson for his committee and I'm an outside member on his committee because of my expertise and work with maker spaces and innovative learning spaces. And she decided, my, my friend Cindy decided she wanted to submit to this conference in Finland. And I knew that I absolutely did not have the funds to go to Finland. I would have to rob a bank. But I still wanted to participate. So we worked it out where she was planning to go with a friend who was keynoting the conference. We submitted a proposal. It was accepted. And so when we presented, she was there in Finland, uh, Savalinia was where the presentation was. And then the joint student and I joined by Skype and we presented virtually. And it was the most wonderful experience that I think I've had because he and I took turns. She set the stage locally, interacting with the individuals in the room. And then he was set up in his makerspace in Chicago, actually in his classroom. I was set up in my makerspace at the time in Laramie, Wyoming, 
And we each took turns showing different equipment and talking about the activities that we did in these spaces. And it really got me to think about, we have the technology, and if we have the ability, trying to purposefully connect online can have some fantastic repercussions. And I know that she made some friends out of that experience. They still collaborate and communicate. But it makes me think about how that was kind of a stepping off point for me. And I love to engage in these virtual spaces to meet with others working in our field because it opens up the doors. It helps us really broaden our experience. And I want to be able to help my students connect. In the fall, I'm launching a class that I, I hope to talk a little bit more about as we find other principles that fit. I'm modeling after uh, Jennifer's design, uh, Designers for Learning online class, but we're working with populations in Nicaragua to source open education resources and learners in Togo, so Northern Africa. And it's in these virtual spaces that I can help my students make these connections to find other professional opportunities. Yeah, that I do. Yeah, we definitely have to spend time on that because I think that that's a great, um, a great example of what we're talking about. Um, and so I'm going to move through real quickly the next three principles because I do want to loop in um, Nicola because you just you mentioned some excellent points here in the text chat. I want to make sure that they're articulated in terms of some of the things that your projects you're working on that give folks the opportunity to participate. Um, and I think they tie into the, the next three themes that we're going to touch on um, re relatively quickly. But this idea of opening up your cabinet of curiosities, um, I think um, just, uh, Tanya's example of, um, of, of taking her Instagrams of buildings, that was her curiosity. And so she opened up um, the world of, of her university to the rest of us. It's something we wouldn't have known. And, and the idea here is also... Um, tying back to what we were saying, you may not be the expert where you're able to, to, to display your own work in its perfect final form, but it, it, it's also very valuable to show the work of others and, and to curate that experience for others and as a way of um, telling people what you're interested in, what your motivations are, and then also, as Tanya mentioned, to also work open us up to the world of, of her university. Um, and, and then I'll also tied with all of this is the ability to craft good stories about what you're doing. It's not a matter of just spamming people on Twitter with like, check this link out or check that link out. It's giving context to why do you find this important? Um, what's some additional information that may, um, may be relevant to others? And so that whole idea of being able to, um, to craft a story around that message. And then uh, we're, I think most of us that are joining this call today uh, are in the education field, so this idea of teaching what, what you know, I doubt that there are any of us who have ever stood in front of a classroom or prepared a, les a lesson for a group that don't appreciate the idea that you learn more than the students when you're preparing a lesson. It's when you really need to know your stuff and you have to be prepared for the questions they may have, you want to make sure that you're covering the important concepts and you're giving them um, great practice opportunities. And so this whole idea of teaching what you know is really very much that two-way street of um, opening up your, your world to teach others. And, and this, again, Cleon was not writing this from the perspective of an educator. He was thinking about this from anything you do, any whether you're an artist or whatever it may be that you do, is, is again, reinforcing this whole idea of teaching your process to let others know, and then also give them the opportunity to ask questions. So what I wanted to do is take a quick pause. Um, if, Nicola, did you want to hop back in and with, the, with your audio and um, review a couple of those virtual connecting opportunities as well as the um, Emerge Africa opportunities that people may have up, upcoming to be able to participate? Yes, I think, um, you know, we've got one actually happening this week that uh, Sandea Ganes, who is attending today, she is actually um, hosting, which is about using the LATAR um, model to, for, to get folks to share um, and design lessons. And I think that that's a great way for folks to, to start sharing. So how do you go about lesson design? Um, can you share a you know, design a lesson from your context. Do you have particular tools, things that you use? Um, yeah, anyway, so that, that's one one of those spaces. And we also, I mean, we've got the Emerge uh, 2018 Festival coming up, happening in July. I'll share a link to that for folks that are interested. 
and then there's the virtually connecting, which is a really interesting community where they have lo um, local buddies. We call them local buddies. Of, local buddies of various conferences, and then they, you know, meet up with folks online who can then ask them questions about, you know, what are the main things people are talking about at the conference? What are some of the big themes? Um, yeah, and those kind of things. So not everyone has the resources to attend a lot of um, conferences. So I think virtually connecting uh, is doing a good job um, of making you know, that kind of thing more accessible. Um, yeah, back. Yeah, that's great. And, and if anyone else has any um, examples of organizations or maybe virtual opportunities where you have the opportunity to present, um, feel free to, to add that to the text chat as well. And I think I'll just use this opportunity to put in another challenge that comes directly from our class and, um, and pose this to the group. As I mentioned, I've been to a lot of online conferences, a lot of meetings this year, or not online, rather. I've been to online as well as face-to-face -face conferences, as well as meeting a lot of people. And so um, what, I've, what I'm finding very interesting is how ill-prepared a lot of the people I'm meeting with are for that interaction. So in our course, we start out with kind of low effort things you can do, ranging up to high effort. And so I, in the challenge I posted just now in the text chat, it's more of those low effort things you can do. Um, but uh, especially in the field of education, I'm finding very few people are prepared with a business card. And I, I know a lot of people think that's like an old-fashioned way to, <laughs> to communicate about yourself. But... It's really practical, and it's usually pretty inexpensive to buy a stack of 200 business cards. You can, here in the United States, you can probably get an online uh, vendor to provide them for about $10 for a stack of, I don't know, 100 or so. But it just is an instant way of showing professionalism, for one, and also for people to find you. So they don't have to go on Google. They don't have to try to figure out what your email address is or where you work. And so... I guess my, if my, my, my pitch for today is, you know, check your, your bag that you carry to work with you every day. And do you have a couple business cards that you could hand to some, someone if they were um, trying to find you? So that's a really, really low effort thing. But then thinking also, like, what, what is your, when you, we talked before about your vanity search, how old is your professional profile? And how old is the photo that you're using? So as Tanya mentioned, she's, she's now at a, um, a new university. But if someone searched for her, I'm sure she's gone through the steps to update it to make sure, um, like on LinkedIn and other places, that it actually reflects where she current, currently is. And then also for, for those of us that maybe have been in our, our jobs for a while, if someone was interested in collaborating with you or maybe you had a new funding opportunity and the funder said uh, on the fly, you know what, if you could send me, it would be really helpful to send me your current resume or your CV. I, I know me personally, if I haven't changed jobs in a while, that, that can get pretty dusty and pretty old, and it may not have all of my, my most current uh, presentations or things like that. And so I just encourage you as part of this challenge to, to go back, uh, go through your computer to, and pull up what is your most current resume that you have available. And then also to think, extending this idea of your vanity search, maybe you do have a pre presence you're able to find yourself but kind of tying back to what, what Tanya was mentioning with Rob, how well do people actually quote, and I'm putting them in air quotes that you can't see, how well are you known by others online? So um, if it, how, how quick would it be if you found an opportunity in some area that you were interested, that you were a, a couple degrees away from finding a person who could actually be a subject matter expert in that, or they would look to you as a subject matter expert in that area? And that is all part of this idea of cultivating your professional pre presence online. So as uh, I think this is maybe an excellent segue then um, for Tanya to talk about her project. She was um, given a project um, to consider with, within her university. And because of our online interactions, um, we had the, uh, the connection already established. So I was one of the calls she made when she was trying to develop her project. And so that, is, that really ties into this, this last concept I have in that challenge I posted is, how well are you actually known for your expertise um, online? So, Tanya, do you want to kind of pick up on that and talk about your project? Absolutely. And thank you for that nice little setup there. Being known online, or at least being known in our field, is something that has been on my mind since I was starting my tenure track uh, at many, or at, actually, yes, at many U.S. institutions. When you're on the tenure track, 
your packet, your materials have to go out for external review. So kind of like a peer evaluation of my performance. And my greatest fear was my packet being sent to somebody who would write back and say, I've never heard of this person. In which case, what have I been working on for the last six years? So when it comes to projects, this is something that designing in the open can truly help with. I mentioned Rob earlier, and I can actually talk a little bit about Rob, what Rob does. But this way, when I hear of opportunities or when someone says, do you know somebody who works in, because of my purposeful online presence, I may not be able to help, but I can connect them with someone else who does. In this case, I, I'm at the University of Idaho. I am the researcher for the Doceo Center for Innovation and Learning, which really quick there, I love that we are the Doceo Center because it is Greek for I teach, I learn. We all do this in our professional lives. We were contacted by the director of the entrepreneurial program here at the University of Idaho. He had a former program winner who had won their competition or had entered this competition. She'd created a nonprofit organization in Togo working with young women to help provide educational opportunities, whether that's supporting the purchase of their school books, supporting the purchase of uniforms, or a variety of other mechanisms that their organization now handles. In this case, she was looking to connect with an organization related to her alma mater or if we could connect her with somebody else that could assist with providing content, actual curriculum content for some of these young women. And this, a, a good example here, they were looking at how do they support a younger group of girls in their program with mobile learning opportunities related to personal health and personal hygiene. So she contacted George who was the entrepreneurial director, he then contacted my counterpart, the director for the Doceo Center. And in this case, we set up a quick meeting to talk about what were their needs. As instructional designers, we are familiar with this process of, oh, we need to conduct a needs analysis. Who are the stakeholders? Where are we talking about geographically? What are the technological limitations or affordances that we had to deal with? And through this conversation, it became very clear that she had the technology down. They had the partnership in place to deliver content to these girls, but they did not have the content itself. I instantly thought of Designers for Learning. I have had, gosh, I think at least two former students of mine have gone through this service learning opportunity, as well as a very good friend of mine, Megan Murtaugh. So I was very familiar, and I guess I was kind of there at the beginning when you started to create DFL, for that matter, which has been exciting to watch Jennifer and this nonprofit operate. So I thought, oh my gosh, I need to contact Jennifer. We wrapped up this first meeting with Peyton and her group, uh, Style Her Empowered, along with George with the entrepreneurial program, and I said, I'll be in touch. So what... I then did was instantly sent an email, introduced everybody to Jennifer, and said, hey, can we have a meeting to see how what you're doing might somehow benefit this project? And at the time, I had no way of knowing exactly what direction it would take, but I was familiar with what Designers for Learning had done and the courses they delivered. I was familiar with Jennifer's work, so we were able to have this great conversation, and what wound up happening I'm now delivering two new classes in the fall. Uh, it's a layered approach where I've taken what Jennifer has done with her service learning course because it is open license, so I can then modify it and continue that open licensing for anyone else to take, use, and adapt. And then I've layered it with my graduate students so that they get project management experience. So I've added a few extra objectives and processes for them as a result of sitting down and meeting and saying, okay, well, we can't necessarily just use designers for learning, but we can apply what they've developed and take this open course and repurpose it for our needs. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was, uh, and I, I do, I really do point to the fact that we found each other online through our work, through sharing our process, and because of it, we were able to have um, a collaboration, and from that, as you're saying, you're putting your work out there into the world, and, and we only know, at the, we have no idea at this point how many lives that will touch just from, um, from as you said, you're putting your work out there um, openly licensed as well. And so we've got about, um, I guess by my clock, about 13 minutes left. So um, I, we've been so rah-rah and rosy-rosy about 
um, living online. But there are a few things that we should probably talk about before we wind down that are not necessarily um, the, the most uh, wonderful aspects of, of openly sharing and being online. And I think a lot of times when we use the words like we were using earlier, like professional branding and things like that, we all have examples of where you kind of roll your eyes when colleagues that you, you can, I'm sure we all have examples, tend to just shamelessly self-promote their stuff. And I think the probably as I've thought about this over the years, the difference between turning into human spam and actually helping um, others is this idea of sharing your process, the pros and the cons of your process. So, um, you know, the word of caution here is don't be that person who only talks about their successes and rah, rah, everything is fantastic in my life and you've created this persona that's wonderful, but it really doesn't reflect you exactly because it doesn't talk about your challenges and, and things that maybe don't turn out perfectly. And so I think that's kind of the, the place where you, you run the risk of turning into human spam is if you're just constantly sh you know, sharing out all the wonderful things you do or you know, buy my course or sign up for this or whatever. I think that that's when openness maybe can, can take a negative turn. And then also learning to take a punch. Uh, as we've, ta we've talked about um, several times already, this idea, if you're putting yourself out there, that's all well and good until you get that one person or a couple people who decide they're going to take you on, they're going to challenge you. And that's actually part of learning, as we all know. Um, obviously, it can, it can devolve into a very negative situation where you get trolls. And unfortunately, I'm knocking on wood. You can't see it right now, but I'm knocking on wood. I've never had a horrible situation where I felt the need to to leave a, a space, an online space that I was at, um, involved in, but um, you know that's kind of on one end of this extreme. But just from a personal example of mine, when I was preparing my dissertation, I, I maintained a blog, and I have my own website, jennifermadrill.com, and I have a blog associated with that, and I was putting out information as I was doing my. Um, as I was preparing my dissertation, and I was taking a pretty direct critique of a body of research. And so within the comments section of one of my posts, one of those authors that I was critiquing um, his work took me on. And it was a very collegial, it was very, it was not negative, he wasn't um, berating me, but it was, it gave me this opportunity to take a punch in a positive manner, manner to stand up for myself and to justify my position that I was taking. And so I think that actually, while it seems like a negative way to phrase it, taking a punch, it can also have a positive aspect um, aspect to it as well. In that you 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 need to defend yourself as you're um, as you're putting yourself out there. Um, then there's this idea of uh, the Cleon touches on in the book called selling out, and I'm sure this is something that most of us can appreciate. Is this idea we have things that we love to do, and then we have things that we do to pay the bills. And so this, again, is this whole idea, this purposeful approach to how you approach your professionalism and the things and where you spend your time. And he makes the point, and let's see if I can find the quote rather quickly. I might not be able to find it real quickly. Um, let's see. Okay, here's his quote directly. If an opportunity comes along that will allow you to do more of the kind of work you want to do, say yes. If an opportunity comes along that would mean more money but less of the kind of work you want to do, consider saying no. And again, this really goes back to being purposeful. Um, I run into this all the time in my nonprofit, and I'm, unfortunately, I probably go too far to doing too much for free that maybe I should be doing more that brings uh, money into the coffers. But I have this uh, approach right now as I'm building our nonprofit that there are certain things that I know need to be done to get our word out there to uh, for our advocacy mission. And so I need to... Um, do some things that I'm maybe not getting compensated for as a way to get out there in the open. And at the same time, keeping my eye on the prize, thinking, how will this benefit me down the road when I do go to a funder and I say, I need money for this, and here's my track record because I've done all of these free things and I've shared with the world and I've been open about it. And so, you know, that's something I think we, we, we really need to consider as we're thinking about our professional presence and, and where we want to work. And finally, the last uh, point is this idea of sticking around. And uh, maybe, Tanya, you have an example of this, but I certainly do with my nonprofit. It's not easy to start a nonprofit. I didn't know what I was doing. I probably had no business starting a nonprofit. 
And so this is that whole mantra of when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I, I'm sure we've all seen examples of pe successful people who say, if I had not stuck through it on this really super challenging thing, I would never have um, achieved what I wanted to do. And so I, I think that's a, a really fitting final, final comment and principle to the book, as well as something that we can clu conclude with here, is this idea of you are going to run into these bumps in the road as you're sharing in the open and as you're getting yourself out there and as, a, as you're trying, trying new things. Um, but if you don't stick around, you won't know if you'll succeed. And failure is part of the process and to embrace it and try to work, figure out ways that you can overcome it. And so that's kind of my, my, what, what I'd like to leave with. And, and Tanya, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this idea of sticking around and, and riding through the rough spots as, as being part of this open process and of showing your work. I kind of want to combine together two of the, the principles here because you talked about, um, and, and I love this principle, you can't just share everything that's rosy. So in the chat box, I've just dropped in a link to one of my favorite. you got to learn to take a punch, and you got to stick around after that punch. So in the chat box, I've given you a link to the CV of failures. If you were to go to the University of Idaho website and pull up my CV right now, you would see all of the things that I've gotten published, the presentations I've given. You'll see this listed as to be delivered under my uh, service and outreach. The only place on my CV that you'll see my failures is I do include grants that weren't funded on my CV. But I like this idea of keeping track of the things that I failed at because life isn't rosy. And not everything I've submitted for publication has gotten published. Not every grant that I've applied for has gotten funded. Not every course evaluation that I've delivered has gotten 100% positive feedback. Um, I even found myself in the middle of a bit of a controversy when the university that I received my undergraduate and my master's degrees at found itself in a little bit of a, a battle online over uh, feminism and sexism when somebody, one of the coaches rewrote the words to one of the school songs to be rather misogynistic. And I was one of the few people on social media who said that this was unacceptable. And oh my goodness, did I come under fire and I was called some very not nice things that you would never say to other people, much less online, behind the safety of a screen. But I had to stick around because I want to see what's next. I want to see what does work and I want to see what impact I can have that's positive. So learning to take a punch, learning to accept that it's not always going to be the best experience. Your ideas may get passed over, which is really frustrating when the person sitting to your left says exactly what you said and suddenly they get heard. You just have to kind of roll with those punches and you have to figure out the systems that you're working in and then be able to stick around because that's what's going to matter. And I, I really hope that some of what Jennifer and I had to share today resonated, if not all of it, at least one or two of the principles. But I like the ability of connecting in the open and having one big professional family. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a perfect, I can't, I can't think of a better way to conclude it <laughs> than what you just said. Um, and if anybody is interested in um, the book that we've been mentioning, I last, at last check, for us here in the United States, it's about six dollars. So I don't think I'm asking anybody to um, to help Austin Kleon, um, you know, finance his next home or anything. This is a fairly modestly priced book. Um, there's also a link there to if you're interested in this concept and exploring it further. Um, we are offering, as a, as I've mentioned a couple times, Designers for Learning is opening a course called um, Design in the Open. So you can find that at designersforlearning.org/opendesign. Um, and then we're all over the place on uh, social media. So if you'd like to join our Facebook groups or our LinkedIn group, um, we're easy to find in all of those spaces. So I don't know, Nicola, did you have any other things you'd like to, to consider or any other thoughts? Um, yeah, just to highlight, and, and I don't want to end on a bad note, but, uh, but that you know, things are not all rosy and openness has also got quite a bit of risk attached to it. I know George uh, Valetianos is working on some work around online harassment uh, and abuse. Um, yeah, so just want to um, highlight that those are possibilities, but it, while it's a minority of cases, um, 
there are channels and you know particularly people in you in in um, yeah, it's, it's something you you may need to get advice on. Yeah, I don't know, Jen. You want to say something about that kind of thing? Yeah, the 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 uh, the, the kind of downside of it. You mean the uh, of 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 the of being online? Is that what you mean? Um, yeah, just how people can seek advice. So if something like that uh, does happen, or yeah, what they could. Yeah, you know, um, I take a pretty practical and pragmatic approach to myself personally. We didn't um, get into it here, but you, we, you and I talked about it in the um, uh, in, when we were preparing. But we've certainly all read about Facebook and privacy issues and um, the release of our information, is using that as one example. And I know for me personally, I did back away a bit. And so I think probably my, my, my best advice, if I had to give advice, was if you are feeling uncomfortable in anything you're doing, back away. Take your stuff down. If you, I mean, even though we have a trail that really is never completely able to be erased once you put something out online, if there is a space you're in and you thought it was something but it turns out not to be what you thought, disengage. That's absolutely fine. Um, you know, some self-care and all of this is, is completely appropriate. So I, I guess um, my, my best advice is to, to, to kind of remove yourself if you can. Now, obviously, if it's as Tanya described in a work setting, you know that that is probably where you then need to involve and involve your your colleagues and others. Um, you know, I, I, said, I said as I mentioned a moment ago, I really haven't had an oper um, an example of where I've had something that's been very very terribly detrimental where I needed to completely change the way I operate. Um, but I think for most informal settings, you know, that's probably my best my best suggestion is to kind of disengage. And I know Tanya, did you have any thoughts on that? I'm actually chuckling because I have a meeting with George at 11 o'clock Pacific time to queue up the next set of studies and that work that he's been doing. Uh, Patrick Lowenthal at Boise State, Ross Kimmons at BYU, um, oh gosh, I just went blank on uh, Larson at BYU as well. We just finished a paper on toxicity and comments on TED Talks. Uh, surprise, surprise, if the speaker is female, then the comments are going, going to be extremely positive or extremely negative. There will not be like a zero scale sentiment in those. Uh, we are looking at some of the mitigation effects. That's one of our upcoming studies, is how do we provide some practical advice and guidance in dealing in these spaces. When you do have someone target you, it may not necessarily be because of your work, it may be because of where you're from, but it could be the work. Uh, we're seeing in the United States now a group called Campus Reform that actively monitors all publications, all academic journal publications. And they look for any studies, doesn't matter if it's a pilot study or if it's a wide, widespread longitudinal study, if it is something that they deem to be too liberal, then they basically put up a megaphone, if you will, on social media and call all hands on deck to harass that person. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon that's happening. So there is this caveat of being careful in these spaces. And if you find yourself tangling with a troll, I like that Nicholas shared the Vice link. That is, it's one of my links that I actually share with my students on how to deal with online harassment. By sharing in the open, you do open yourself up to the possibility of engaging with trolls. My first rule is not to directly engage with them. So that's something to keep in mind. But then beyond that, where you are comfortable and engaging. You have to find what works for you. All the principles that we shared have worked in tandem. No one principle is a silver bullet, but you've got to be careful and you've got to take care of yourself first. Well, I think we've hit our, our time wall, right? Very, very well, guys. It's been amazing and very, very engaging. So yeah, thank you so much. I just want to see if there are any final questions uh, that folks perhaps want to type in the text chat. Um, and if you want to tweet about the webinar today, you can use the hashtags um, Open Design and Emerge Africa. Um, yeah, please share about your experience. 
And I did, I did want to also, yeah, I did want to mention the, the, I, I, we talked a little bit about shameless self-promotion, whatever. <laughs> so the course link that I put in the chat, we do charge 20 US dollars for the course and all of those proceeds go to our nonprofit. So no, uh, not me personally, uh, Tanya personally, we are not profiting from this. Um, it's just a means of keeping the lights on within our nonprofit and funding, funding the nonprofit's operations. Most of the work we do it's for free. They're free, free service learning courses, but we are offering this as a, as a means for people to not only engage in these concepts we're talking about, um, but to also your contribution, your $20 is a contribution to the nonprofit. So I did want to make that clear that this is a course that we do happen to charge a little bit of money for, and, and that's why. That's the reason behind it. Thank you, Jen. Um, just a question here. How do we, uh, folks that want to access the PowerPoint, I'm wondering if oh, we should sure. share it. Yeah, but definitely feel free, feel free. And actually, that's a good idea. I think the PowerPoint, is, the version I gave you also has speaker notes, and so it has links that might be um, also important for people to be able to, to click through to. Feel free. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, folks, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is post that in the Facebook event page. Um, and I think, Jakob, you want to put it on the Emerge. Um, what we do is we go back to the Emerge website, and we also edit those. So we're going to post, I think we will put it there as well. Um, yeah, so thanks yeah, very much, everyone. Yeah, I think um, everyone Marie was just this. asking a question about, um, is there any software required for our online course? No, it's just you just need a web browser and, um, and you just find it's an online class. So not, nothing new you need to purchase. Great. Um, I see multiple folks are typing, but I think I've... Um, yeah, I can say that folks really seem to have enjoyed today. I see we have a couple of um, folks who joined us late, um, so you can catch up on the recording, which we'll share to our YouTube channel. And yeah, I know it's super early your side, so thank you for waking up early and being available to speak to us. And have a great day further. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Jen. Bye, Tanya. Thanks, Bye. Yeah. Bye.